Hey guys and welcome back to my channel for another video where today I suppose we've got a history video. I had no idea how I was going to categorise this but I suppose it is an interesting part of history and we all know that I love a bit of medical history in particular. So here we go. Before we get into it I just have to give a shout out here to the Sawbones podcast which is a podcast about misguided medicine and it's where I first heard about this story a few months ago and I like haven't been able to stop thinking about it since. I just have to share this story with you all. So in the early 1900s, a man called Duncan McDougall embarked on a mission to find the weight of the human soul. I suppose in doing so, he was also on a mission to discover once and for all if the soul is an actual physical concept with a weight, or if it's more of just a spirit, weightless, or I suppose if it doesn't exist at all. But first, I want to thank Surfshark for sponsoring this week's video. Surfshark is a VPN, an app and a browser extension that basically lets you access the internet as if you're in any country in the world. You can access and unblock websites that might not usually be available for wherever you are. I've spoken of my frustrations many a time before of trying to access articles for research and coming across a roadblock of this page is not available in your region. You find the same on a lot of YouTube videos as well. With Surfshark, I can simply change my location over to the USA or wherever in the world I need to be to access that particular article and voila, I have full access to all of the information I need. I can't stress enough how many more cases I've been able to cover since I got Surfshark and my own subscription actually ran out recently and in the literally just hours that I didn't have access to Surfshark, I literally couldn't do my job and I have no idea how I survived beforehand. But of course, my personal favourite perk of having Surfshark is the ability to access Netflix all around the world. Me and my girlfriend are currently working our way through all of the Harry Potter films again, but I misplaced all of my DVDs in the move, I have no idea where they went. So I've been trying to buy all the movies online, but I decided to have a search around the world on Netflix to see if they're available anywhere. And I'm very excited to announce that Canada actually has the last four films available. So I don't know why it's just the last four, but they do, which works out perfectly because we just finished Goblet of Fire. So that's gonna save me a little bit of money. Surfshark also adds an extra layer of security when you're online to keep all of your passwords, photos, videos, and personal information safe, as well as giving you a way to stay generally safe and anonymous online. It's also the only VPN to offer one account to use on a limited number of devices, and it's super easy to use. You can use my code MARIE to get 84% off plus an extra four months for free. And Surfshark offers a 30 day money back guarantee so there's absolutely no risk. If you try it and it's not for you, it's no problem. I'll link it in the top line of the description box down below. So I suppose we should start this video with a bit of a look at the concept of the soul, getting very deep in this one. The Oxford Dictionary defines the soul as a spirit or immaterial part of a human being or animal regarded as immortal. I suppose that's the easiest and most simple explanation. In all honesty, anything more than that I found very difficult to research because at the end of the day, the soul is just a concept. Nobody knows anything about the soul. It's said to be the part of a human which embodies their self, their desires. Your soul is who you are at your very core of being. It's your life force, it's your energy. Whilst the human body slowly perishes, the soul is said to be imperishable. The soul will always remain intact. This is actually a big argument that many religions use for reincarnation, that when the human body dies, this everlasting soul has to find a new body to attach to, and through this, the spirit of a person lives on. And in fact, most religions argue that there is more to a human than just the brain, that there has to be a soul. And a lot of people consider the belief in a soul to be a purely religious belief. Although that isn't always the case, you don't have to be religious to believe in the soul. Some think of it as an actual physical organ of sorts, whilst others picture the soul as just the human spirit. It can't be grasped or held, it just is. Honestly, it's hard to encompass a whole world's views of the soul in a video like this. There isn't one simple definition understood and followed by everyone, and it's beginning to hurt my brain a little bit. Each person has their own thoughts and feelings on what the soul is, and if it even exists. Personally, I view the soul as just who a person is at their very core. I don't think it's anything physical or anything that can be captured or anything religious. I just think it's something within a person that makes them who they are. I think it's more of a state of mind rather than a thing, if that makes sense. But that's just my thoughts. Everyone's different. But back in the early 1900s, a man called Dr. Duncan McDougall of Haverhill, Massachusetts, set out on a mission to find out once and for all if the soul weighed anything and therefore if it exists at all. 
For hundreds, maybe thousands of years, people have believed the soul to have a physical presence. And if that's the case, it must weigh something. This experiment had a very simple premise. If McDougall could prove that people lost weight at the exact moment of their death, then it must be the soul leaving the body and therefore it would prove its existence. He published his findings in American Medicine in April 1907 in a paper entitled Hypothesis Concerning Soul Substance Together with Experimental Evidence of the Existence of Such Substance, which is just a very complicated way of saying, I try to find out if the soul exists. I'm going to link the entire paper down below, which you can go read, but I would suggest doing so after this video because otherwise it's going to be a bit of a spoiler. The opening couple of paragraphs of this paper sum up his thought process behind conducting this experiment, and it reads, If personal continuity after the event of bodily death is a fact, if the psychic functions continue to exist as a separate individually or personality after the death of brain and body, then such personality can only exist as a space occupying body. Unless the relations between space objective and space notions in our consciousness, established in our consciousness by hereditary and experience, are entirely wiped out at death and a new set of relations between space and consciousness suddenly established in the continuing personality. This would be an unimaginable breach in the continuity of nature. It is unthinkable that personality and consciousness continuing personal identity should exist and have being and yet not occupy space. Since therefore it is necessary to the continuance of conscious life and personal identity after death that they must have for a basis that which is space occupying or substance, the question arises, has this substance weight? Is it ponderable? Which is basically a really long winded way of McDougall saying that he doesn't understand how sort of consciousness and personality can exist and not occupy space. That it must create space somewhere in the human body and that when the human body dies, that space must go somewhere else, if that makes sense. I think about it in terms of energy. There's always a constant amount of energy on Earth, or so some people say. So that energy, when a human dies, must go elsewhere. Is that a human soul? Is a soul going from the body to another body? It's something that doesn't have an answer, it's something that people just ponder on, but I think that's basically what he's getting at here. He goes on to explain that the latest understanding of science explains that all substances and space-occupied materials have weight, and therefore it seemed impossible to him that the soul would not have weight itself, with it being so important for personal identity. He was going to weigh people before their deaths, and then again at the exact moment of their deaths, and see if there was a difference, meaning that these people would have to be on the scales that McDougall had devised at the exact moment of death. The scales he was going to use for this would have to be incredibly sensitive, able to detect even the smallest amount of weight change, and they'd have to be big enough to accommodate a human lying down, something which most scales were not designed to do. I remember that this is the early 1900s, digital scales were not a thing, we're talking about old timey balance scales here, just one huge scale. And therefore McDougall had to come up with his own scale system to weigh these bodies, devising something on which the bed was arranged in a very light framework which was built upon a very carefully balanced platform beam scales. But the issue of the scales wasn't the only issue he'd face in trying to conduct his experiment. There was also the problem of finding people who'd be willing to be weighed at the exact moment of their death, willing to be a part of this very, very strange experiment. These had to be people who were guaranteed to die very soon, and if that's the case, and I'm sure a lot of them were probably unable to make decisions for themselves. So it was probably up to the family members to decide if they wanted their loved one to be a part of this odd experiment. I'm sure if this experiment happened nowadays, there would be all kinds of hoops that had to be jumped through for this to be ethical. But for McDougall back then, it probably wasn't all that difficult. It was just a matter of finding people who were about to die. But of course, it couldn't be people who'd be thrashing around in pain at the moment of their deaths. That could mess up the balance of the scales. It had to be peaceful deaths, people just falling away in their sleep. The obvious option here was tuberculosis. McDougall wrote in his paper, it seemed to me best to select a patient dying with a disease that produces such great exhaustion, the death occurring with little or no muscular movement, because in such a case the team could be kept more perfectly at balance and any loss occurring readily noted. So the first subject was a man dying of tuberculosis. McDougall observed him on the scale for 3 hours and 40 minutes before his death, in which time they made sure he was comfortable. 
It's noted that the man slowly lost weight in the time he was on the scale, at the rate of one ounce per hour, which McDougall put down to evaporation of moisture in respiration and evaporation of sweat. After three hours and 40 minutes, he died and the scale moved, a loss of three quarters of an ounce, equivalent to just over 21 grams. For a bit of context, that's apparently the weight of your average mouse, or almost as heavy as an AA battery. He wrote that the loss here could not be put down to evaporation, as it happened more suddenly than had been happening in the lead up to the death. The bowels also did not move, although it is noted that even if they did, the weight of the faecal matter would still have remained on the bed. The subject did urinate slightly, but the liquid, like I said, remained on the bed, and therefore was part of the overall weight. The only question McDougall had was that it could have possibly been caused by the expiration of residual air in the lungs. So to test that this wouldn't cause such a drop in weight, he actually got on the scales himself and forcibly inhaled and exhaled as much air as possible. And this had no effect on the weight. For McDougall, this was telling. Did he really just prove the existence of the human soul? But the rest of his experiment didn't go as positively for him though. In total, he weighed six patients at the moment of death, with the second patient also being a man suffering from tuberculosis. He was on the bed for four hours and 15 minutes before his death, during which time he lost about three quarters of an ounce per hour. But this patient's death was much more gradual than the first. He just slowly passed away rather than his heart suddenly stopping. And so they struggled to pinpoint the exact moment of death. McDougall does write that the patient ceased breathing in the last 15 minutes, but his facial muscles still moved convulsively. Apparently the scale dropped half an ounce at the moment of the last movement of the facial muscles. The colleague then checked the heart had stopped and by the time it was confirmed, the scales had dropped an ounce and a half. But no further losses happened after this point. The third patient was another man with tuberculosis, showing a drop of half an ounce at the moment of death, with an additional loss of one whole ounce a few minutes later. The fourth was a woman in a diabetic coma, which McDougall admitted was not a sound experiment. The scales were not well enough adjusted and there was a good deal of interference from people opposed to the work. The scales did drop about half an ounce, maybe less, but he regarded this test as no value. The fifth case was yet another man dying of tuberculosis, but again, this experiment didn't quite go to plan. There was a drop of three eighths of an ounce upon death, but then it seemed that the weight was regained and didn't drop off again for another 15 minutes. This was unexplainable. And the sixth and last case was not a fair test at all. The patient died sooner than expected, within just five minutes of being placed on the bed, and whilst McDougall was still in the process of adjusting the beam of the scale. He did note in the paper that there was once again a loss of one and a half ounces, but he couldn't have justifiably recorded it as part of the experiment. It's also noted that after each death, a further loss of weight would take place 20 to 30 minutes later, due to the evaporation of the urine that the deceased had usually passed. McDougall tested this theory by placing the same amount of water directly on the scales and keeping every other condition in the room the same, and apparently it showed the same drop in weight. So everything was accounted for, except for this 21-ish gram drop in weight that was shown in a couple of his subjects. Could this indeed be the soul departing from the body? To further his experiment, McDougall also decided to work on dogs under very similar circumstances. He was to weigh them before and at the moment of their death. There was a prevailing thought in society at the time that dogs didn't actually have souls as humans do, so if this hypothesis was correct, there should be absolutely no drop in weight at the moment of death. I very much refute this, as I'm sure if there is such a thing as a soul, dogs are probably more likely to have them than humans, but I digress. In a point that I'm sure is going to anger many of you, McDougall was actually unable to obtain dogs that were dying of a disease that rendered them exhausted and incapable of struggle. He writes in his paper that the dogs were given two drugs to secure the necessary quiet and freedom from struggle, but he doesn't specify exactly how the dogs actually died, and his wording makes it sound as if these drugs were administered to simply keep the dogs still and not to kill them. His lack of explanation here has led many to speculate that he actually poisoned perfectly healthy dogs. First he accuses dogs of having no soul, and then he poisons them. He repeated this experiment on 15 dogs, all weighing between 15 and 70 pounds, and he registered no change in weight in the moment of their deaths, thus proving his theory that dogs have no souls and solidifying the results of the earlier experiment, like humans do. In the conclusion of his paper, he writes, 
that the net result of the experiments conducted on human beings is that a loss of substance occurs at death not accounted for by known channels of loss. Is it the sole substance? It would seem to me to be so. According to our hypothesis, such a substance is necessary to the assumption of continuing or persisting personality after bodily death. And here we have experimental demonstration that a substance capable of being weighed does leave the human body at death. So McDougall's stance here is pretty clear. He believed the human soul did indeed have a weight and it did indeed exit the body at the moment of death. But he also did acknowledge that his experiment wasn't exactly the best, as many other people have also pointed out over the years. I mean, anyone who has any knowledge of scientific experiments has probably been watching this in exasperation. Only six subjects, hardly an adequate sample size for such an important investigation. He writes that he's aware that a large number of experiments should be conducted before the matter can be proven beyond any possibility of error. If other experiments prove that there is a loss of weight occurring at death that's not accounted for by other known channels of loss, then the theory of a soul should be admitted or some other explanation has to be brought forward to change his mind. As previously mentioned, McDougall's results were published in April 1907 in the medical journal American Medicine, as well as in the Journal of the American Society for Psychical Research. It was actually the New York Times that broke the story in the March in an article entitled Soul Has Weight, Physician Thinks. It said that a reputable doctor believes that the soul has definite weight. But as we've probably all realised by this point, there were a lot of issues with this experiment which people have used to discredit it over the years. The first obvious issue is that he only got actual good results, what he considered to be good results, in one out of six and has somehow gone on to make these big claims. The first subject did show an immediate drop of weight upon death, but not a single other one did. This was the only one with a sudden, non-reversible drop of weight, and that's not a sign of good, positive findings. And not to mention, of course, that the sample size here was only six. It was a tiny sample size, and it wouldn't be considered good enough in any experiment. To form a proper hypothesis in something like this, you would need to test hundreds, probably thousands of people. And at the very core of this study is the moment of death, but what exactly is the moment of death considered to be? Is it once the heart stops beating, once the brain has stopped working, cellular death? We know of course that many people's hearts stop beating on a daily basis, only to be brought back to life with CPR or other medical interventions. Under the terms of McDougall's experiment, what would this mean? Would the soldiers come back into the body once the heart starts beating again, or does the soldiers know once the human is dead and for all and then leaves? As you can imagine, McDougall was met with a lot of criticism after his paper was published. Another physician called Augustus Clark noted that at the time of death there is a sudden rise in body temperature as the lungs are no longer cooling the blood. This rise in temperature could very much account for a rise in sweating and therefore a sudden evaporation of 21 grams worth of sweat. Clark also pointed out that dogs don't sweat in the same way that humans do, and so this could account for the difference between the experiments of human and the canine experiment. Clark got his own criticism published in the American Journal himself, and then McDougall replied to it, and then Clark replied, and they continued on like this until December of the same year, all published. Overall nowadays, this is considered to be a failed experiment, and nobody official places much weight on it. But the 21 gram experiment, as it went on to be known, is infamous. People refer to it today. The experiment has been the basis for a couple of movies and TV shows, and he did make popular the idea that the soul does indeed have a weight. Of course, there have been copycat experiments conducted over the years, the most notable of which being a 2001 experiment by Lewis E. Hollander Jr. He wrote a paper entitled Unexplained Weight Gain Transients at the Moment of Death. Yeah, his findings showed weight gain, not loss. Although he did conduct his experiment on different animals, one ram, seven ewes, three lambs, and one goat, so not quite humans. Hollander's paper opens with, the question of a change in body weight at death has been considered for almost a century. The experiment reported here is the first to use a sensitive one part in 20,000 electronic scale with a response time of 0.2 seconds. Previous measurements have all been made with beam balance scales. Almost every parameter of the physiology of humans and animals has been accurately measured at the time of death, except weight. This time, with it being 2001 and all, an electric scale was used, and therefore there was a lot less room for human error. 
The animals used were all destined for the slaughterhouse and the experiments were held under vet supervision with maximum concern for the well-being of the animals. The animals were sedated and then asphyxiated whilst on the scale. This experiment also confronted the question about which point death happens, stating that transition to death can occur any time between 10 and 200 seconds after the last deep breath. They were also able to measure the heart signal and see at which point it stopped beating. This experiment showed that each adult sheep upon death gained between 18 to 780 grams of weight, which they would eventually lose and return back to their normal weight. So what does this prove? Well, nobody's entirely sure, but it definitely adds an interesting angle to this argument. This experiment has also been subject to many critical reviews as well, so nobody can really seem to agree on anything in this argument. The conclusion? Not really much. Duncan McDougall's experiment didn't really prove anything, although it is interesting to ponder on it for sure. If not the human soul leaving the body, what is the cause of that very slight drop in weight? I would be very interested to see this experiment conducted again on a wider sample with accurate modern technology, but of course the ethics around it are very questionable and it's difficult to find people who are willing to be part of such an experiment, although I'm sure there would be people who are willing to do it. I can't say I believe in a physical human soul that weighs anything. If I do believe in a soul, like I said, I think it's more of a concept. It's who you are at your core. It's a metaphorical state of being rather than a literal one. But who am I to say? I don't know anything more than anyone else. And I think the human soul is something that pretty much nobody knows anything about for sure. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you guys found it as interesting as I did. I love little weird experiments like this. So let me know if you know of any other things similar to this. And I suppose I'll see you in the next one. Bye guys.